Uh, Mike, I'm so excited to talk to our first guest today, Marcus A. Clark, uh, the director of the documentary Blood Brothers, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. It's on Netflix now. I've seen it a couple of times. And uh, Marcus, it's so exciting to talk to you, brother, uh, because it's a, this is a story, this relationship of two titans uh, of American history. Uh, I, I was saying to somebody, like, two of the people in, in elementary school where there's a bunch of famous black people on the wall, two of them were blood brothers and best friends for a three-year period, two of the most important figures of the 20th century and beyond. Um, I've always wanted to see this story told. Frankly, I want to tell this story. So I was so Thank excited you. when it came out, and it lived up to my expectations. You did a phenomenally thorough job. And I'm going to ask you my first question from the perspective, again, of somebody who wanted to see this story. And we started one night, one night in Miami to an extent, which was great, but wanted to see a deep dive on this. What was this... I don't want to say burden because it's kind of a negative connotation. What was this mantle like for you? What was this responsibility mm -hmm. like for you to not? It's hard enough to tell Malcolm's story, hard enough to tell Muhammad's story, but to tell their intersection. Tell, what was yeah. this like for you, man? Absolutely, man. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, you nailed it with that first question. I mean, there was a, a great deal of responsibility, um, and that responsibility really was a gift. You know, it wasn't a burden. Um, and, you know, from when I first came on the project, I was aware of kind of the opportunity that was in front of me. Um, I was aware of how rare this story was and that I had an ability to tell this story uh, uniquely and authentically in a way that was different. Um, and so it was a really powerful experience just going through the process of putting the story together. And like you mentioned, you know, there's so much information about Malcolm X independently and there's so much information about Muhammad Ali independently. Uh, it was a real challenge to kind of weave the stories together. And so there was an opportunity to do a little bit of like parallel storytelling, if you will, and show, showing from whence these men came, you know, what was their childhood like? What was their early upbringing like? And how did those events kind of influence um, why this relationship would be so potent and be so important? And so, you know, I took that responsibility. I kind of, you know, wore it on my shoulders as we made the film and tried to make the best decisions to present a really balanced story, but a really deep dive, you know, into the culture into the nuances of the relationship and some of the challenges, you know, that existed between them. You know, you think about this, Marcus, uh, when you're going through any kind of project, you know, I just look at uh, myself from, from a book standpoint, you know, you have this long project and you still come back to, you know, one or two things. You just remind yourself, this, what I'm, this is what I'm trying to do. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm the person for this moment. What was it for you? Did, did you look at it that way? Did you distill it to that, uh, you know, midpoint at the beginning? This is what I'm trying to do. And if so, what was that thing you kept reminding yourself? Well, you know, again, the, the responsibility was a big part of it. Um, but the process for me was really, you know, a process of discovery, um, not just following the story and outlining the relationship, um, but into myself, you know, and into my culture, into where I come from. You know, I'm born in Bro Brooklyn, New York, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my parents were, you know, Jamaican, of Jamaican descent. And so, you know, there was a lot of kind of cultural uh, nuances and, um, you know, inflection points that were personal to me. And that was like the influence of Marcus Garvey and working that into the story. And so the whole process of production was a deep dive. And I kept trying to, you know, follow the story and outline, you know, just what the most important elements were. But for me, you know, it was a lot of, it was a lot of maturity. It was a lot of discovery. And it was a lot of, staying focused on the core relationship, staying focused on the, the core premise of the story. You know, with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, there's so much information and legacy to get into, really whittling down what are the moments that these men's lives cross? What are the right. moments that were most impactful to both of these men together? Um, that was how we had to really stay laser focused on the story. And of course, when you watch, there's, there's plenty of things that, you know, we could have gone into and other kind right. of detours we could have taken with the story. And that's part of the challenge with a film like this is really staying focused on what is the yeah. mission, right? Yeah. What is exactly, what is the narrative? What is the mission? And how do all of these moments in the archival material and the video and the photos, how do these underscore the premise of this exact relationship and this specific three year time period between 1962 and 1965? You know, Marcus, uh, seeing this footage just uh, warms my heart. And I just think about some of the moments that you've talked about in this film and that we know from history, like Malcolm X uh, with, the, with the fight, with the win, with the surprising win in Miami, 
uh, that that uh, then Cassius Clay had, and then we found out he was Muhammad Ali. But uh, you know that happened. Malcolm is there taking pictures, but Malcolm used to incorporate, you know, Muhammad Ali stories into his speeches. Hey, I was watching my brother the other night, and this. So uh, w clearly, from the name of this show, we have a great appreciation for brotherhood. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, you know, what were some of those moments? A couple of them. Those those brotherhood nuggets, those ones that just that you cherished uh, in this relationship that maybe doesn't get a lot of attention uh, or as much attention as some other stories between these two. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, Malcolm X not only was a visionary um, and an incredible orator, um, speaker, civil rights leader, but he was also he was a man, he was a father, um, and he was a brother. And between him and Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay at the time. You know, Malcolm was uh, sharing a lot of the wisdom that he had. You know, he was 17 years uh, Cassius' senior. And so he had a better, better understanding of the world, of the nation of Islam and their teachings. And he had a great deal of understanding of psychology. And he really believed in Cassius Clay before everyone else believed in Cassius Clay. And I think that's an important takeaway from this film. You know, when Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, went into the fight against Sonny Liston, he was the underdog. Nobody thought he was going to win that fight. Sonny Liston was a beast. He was a beast and he was a brute and he was someone that people feared. And Cassius Clay, you know, big talker, but people didn't think he had a chance to win that fight. Malcolm X did think so. In fact, he believed in him. And that meeting that they had before the fight, he impressed on him, you know, not only is this your destiny, but you are divine and you have the ability to win this fight. In fact, you're supposed to win this fight. And so today we would say, you know, he put Malcolm X put the battery in his back. And so when Cassius Clay comes out for that fight, and, you know, does what we all know, he becomes the heavyweight champion. Um, this sends shockwaves through the sports community and through the nation kind of as in general, America. Um, this is a big moment for black people. Um, this is a big moment for confidence and for pride. Uh, this is a big moment for Islam. And, you know, I think that one of the rarest clips in the film comes from Malcolm X right after the fight in which he talks about the psychology, you know, of people who understand psychology and the impact that the image of seeing someone like Cassius Clay win, mm -hmm. you know, they knew that if, if, if people start associating with that, they'd have Negroes running around saying, I'm the greatest. Mm -hmm. And so Malcolm X had the foresight, the insight to say, this man has an incredible amount of potential, not just physically, but right. in order to, to change the, the opinion and the impression of black people um, around the world. And so in that way, he was a visionary. And, and in that way, you know, I think people sometimes forget that Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, had someone like that in his corner, really in his ear, um, providing him the confidence and the inspiration and the faith and the wisdom to be able to achieve great things, you know, incredible things. All that despite Malcolm's uh, disinterest, uh, general disinterest in sports. Um, but let me ask you this. Um, you, I'm sorry, you have, you have something you want to add? Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, it's noteworthy that before Cassius Clay wins, um, the Nation of Islam actually did not uh, support sports. They were not right. in favor of sports or in competition, which, of course, you know, uh, affects Malcolm in, a, in some way because he kind of diverges from that in order to support mm -hmm. Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali. And the reason for that, from my understanding and my research, is, you know, sports and competition involve a certain amount of luck which is kind of the absence of, of godliness or of religion. Um, and so that's why they were kind of persuaded away from sports. But after he becomes a heavyweight champion and now he is this, this figurehead, um, he gets all the support, you know, including the nation yeah. in, in his, in his you know, athletic abilities. Yeah. Uh, not, and no pun intended, but from my vantage point, you did not pull any punches when it came to telling this story. Um, you know, Malcolm, of course, was assassinated um, in uh, 1965. And, um, you know, we lost Ali not that long ago. But a lot of this still feels fresh in many respects. In other words, Marcus, you waded into some sensitive waters uh, with two very important legacies uh, mm -hmm. that still resonate, whether it's, you know, the Nation of Islam, uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, children and family, Malcolm's children and family. I wonder what it was like for you politically to produce this story and to tell it in an authentic and accurate way. Yeah, uh, that was definitely a big challenge with the film. Because um, one, I wanted to uphold the legacies in a way that 
you know, we can celebrate them and respect their contributions and every part of, you know, what they've accomplished. But also, you know, if we're going to get into this story, we got to get into the real. Um, that's what makes it authentic, and that's what makes it kind of a deep dive into this complicated relationship. Um, this isn't an easy relationship to understand or to dissect. And so for me, it was really important to, to present enough context, and not only that, but to present the sentiment in which, you know, the fever, the sentiment, the temperature of what was going on at that time to understand, you know, why was this so controversial? Um, what did Malcolm do and, and what was the impact of what Malcolm said um, to people who were, you know, devout followers of the nation? What was what was this vitriol? What was the anger or the, you know, the, the what was the anger that could have led to, you know, someone being taken from us in this way? And so to do that, you know, it's a really human story. Um, people are, are, are many things. People are loyal. People are disloyal. People do good things. People do bad things. And to get to the core of the story and the core of the, the rift um, that ripped these two men apart, we had to go deep into, you know, some of the difficult issues. And I think, you know, through some of the interviews like Rahman Ali, Muhammad Ali's brother, who's with him, you know, throughout the course of his journey of his life from a kid, you know, all the way to the end, um, you know, he's there. He's there in between him and Malcolm. He's there around Muhammad Ali at every pivotal point in his life. And through the documentary, you can see he has a lot of admiration for Malcolm X. He has a lot of admiration for the relationship that him and his brother had with Malcolm X. But when we get to some of these issues of the betrayal um, and some of these things that Malcolm was saying, he still harbors a serious amount of frustration and anger. And it's kind of like it's difficult for him to talk about these things. But I think it really shows a range of the emotions that are at play. Um, that you can have respect for somebody while also noticing uh, maybe their mistakes in some people's eyes or their transgressions in some people's eyes. And I think to understand who these men were, you have to see some of their flaws, um, to understand what, you know, what they were going through, what motivated them, what could have motivated them, and kind of the complexity of the relationship. People tend to forget Muhammad Ali was in his 20s when this right. happened. And so there's a lot of complicated kind of politics, social so, social politics and political politics and, you know, religious politics that he was trying to navigate at a very, very young age. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this is not, going into the mistakes is not to uh, place blame on anybody in particular, but to really show a holistic picture of, of all the different circumstances and why this was so complicated and the emotions yeah. behind some of what was going on at that time. And you've spoken previously about Malcolm, excuse me, Muhammad Ali, as we know him, does not exist without the influence of, of his big brother, uh, so, more, so to speak, uh, Malcolm X, which brings me to more of a contemporary question, if you will. Just given how much you know, just want to focus on, on Ali for a second, how much you know sure. about him, uh, gold standard for what it means to be a black athlete uh, in America. Um, how does it make you feel, Again, given the work you've done and the research you've done and how much you've come to know about this man? How does it make you feel um, when, whether it's LeBron James or uh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, or even some have dared to place Kyrie Irving in that tradition, so to speak? Um, how does it make you feel when anybody contemporary is compared to Ali? Well, I think that uh, I think that's a natural kind of comparison. I think sometimes people, you know, time is a really important element in all of these stories, right? And time changes the legacy of men. That's something we get into in the film. Um, and so I think it's hard to make comparisons between, you know, people in the present day without acknowledging that time hasn't passed yet. So Colin Kaepernick in my opinion, is very close to the legacy of Muhammad Ali in terms of what he's doing, what he stands for, and actually taking those sacrifices for what he believes in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think any athlete that does that and endures the sacrifices, which is the hardest part, it's not just making a statement, but it's actually taking mm -hmm. the sacrifice for what you believe in, that's the most important part. And so I think those comparisons are fair. Now, are they Muhammad Ali? No, they're not. But they are something like it. They're close yeah. to it. And so there's a lot of people, I've spoken on this before, who might love Muhammad Ali, celebrate Muhammad Ali, and then not understand why Colin Kaepernick is kneeling, which is a very yeah. conflicting conflicting attitude to have. If you love yeah. Muhammad Ali and support what this man is about and you know what he's about, how could you not support what Colin Kaepernick is about and what he's standing for? 
And so, you know, I think the, the test of time will show that Kaepernick was on the right side of history um, yeah. and that there were a lot of forces that were working against him. Um, and I think any athlete that really stands up for what they believe in um, has to, you have to make the comparison or the connection to Muhammad Ali because he showed us that it's possible to do that. And when Muhammad Ali stood up against the Vietnam War, this was wildly controversial. People called him a draft dodger. People, you know, this was a big deal. This was not something casual. He, he endured sacrifices for what he believed in. And so to me, that's the most important part because it takes an incredible amount of backbone uh, to stand up for what you believe in against the, the, the will of the time period. Um, and that's a right. really important element. There is no cap without that's Ali, such, quite simply. That's, that's, a, right. that's such a great, that's that's right. such a, such a great point. Such a great point, Marcus. And you think about uh, leaders, so many leaders who are, who are exalted now weren't in their time, whether it was Malcolm or Ali, yeah. uh, whether it was MLK, MLK. who at yeah. one point was one of the most unpopular people in America. <laughs> And now he's got a holiday, you know, uh, celebrated by conservatives right. and liberals, which is, uh, which is really interesting. But you said something, and, right. and, you know, it just really uh, it stuck with me. You said, uh, "This is a relationship between uh, Ali and Malcolm that was, you know, difficult to understand. It's complicated. Um, you can't just break it down." So, with this difficult relationship, you walk away from this project. You've done tons of research. You really, uh, it, it, you put yourself into it. What did you learn about this complicated relationship that maybe you know you didn't realize before? There's there's is there a part of this relationship you're like, oh wait a minute. <laughs> I see it now. I didn't and I wanted this project. I didn't see it before. Yeah, well, to be honest, a lot of the project was that because like I mentioned, I knew about both of them respectively separately. And you know, a lot of research went into this, all the films, all the books, you know, publications, and there really is a lack of coverage of the friendship. And so a lot of it was me asking, you know, why have we seen so many movies and documentaries that have not touched on the impact of this relationship, which was yeah. significant. This is not like some small sidebar relationship. This was significant to the man that Muhammad Ali became. And if you look at what he spent his life doing in his later years, it's almost an extension of that relationship, of the, the, the principles of that relationship. Um, it's a performance of what Malcolm X saw in him and his ability to reach black and brown people around the world. And so he takes that mantle and he continues with that work. And so it's kind of like a symbolic, in, to my, in my opinion, a symbolic throwback to the man that helped him kind of get to where he was and understand who he was, you know, as a black man, as a black athlete, as a, as a black Muslim um, at that time. And so, so much of this was discovery um, and really bringing to the surface the importance of this of this pivotal relationship. And then for me, again, the big part of the kind of the, uh, the third act of the film where this new information comes up is that in his later years, Muhammad Ali actually reaches out to the next of kin of Malcolm X. He reaches out to Atala Shabazz. He reaches out to Ilyasa Shabazz and forms this new relationship with them. Um, and as if you've seen the film, Ilyasa mentions, you know, it's likely that he felt that he owed it to Malcolm to play a role in their life. And so this is new information that we, we really hadn't known how deep it went before. And so, you know, that's a very private part of their relationship. And so we did the best to kind of bring that to the surface and to show that there was this gesture from Ali to form this relationship, which I think underscores that later in his life, he really did, this was really one of his greatest regrets. And he writes that yeah. in the book, Soul of a Butterfly, you know, for the greatest, you know, we know him as the greatest, the greatest boxer, the greatest athlete, the greatest of all time. For him to say that his greatest regret was turning his back on Malcolm X, I mean, that says it all. That says it all. And that, that, that knowing that is how I was approaching the film. Let's approach it from this regret and redemption story. Yeah. Um, watching uh, election coverage last night and the results, so much of what Malcolm said in the 60s resonates now. Couldn't help but wonder what he would say about America in general, you know, the Democratic Party in particular, just, but that's a conversation for another day. Bottom line, Marcus Clark, uh, brilliant work, brother. Uh, the film is Blood Brothers. If it's not, if you haven't seen it, it needs to be in your watch list. And do yourself a favor and check out Bro Blood Brothers on Netflix. Phenomenal work, and we can't wait to see what you do next, man. Thanks for spending some time with us. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me today to talk about Blood Brothers. I really appreciate it. All right, talk to you again Thank soon. You. All right, be good. 
Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.